Miami in the US. It is an honor for me to be joining this presentation from GFI that I will introduce in a brief moment. Uh, GFI or Global Financial Integrity is a Washington DC based think tank focused on illicit financial flows, corruption, illicit trade and money laundering. For those of you who don't know, GFI uses high caliber analysis, fact-based advocacy and strategic advisory work to address the harms inflicted by trade, trade mis-invoicing, transnational crime, financial crime and kleptocracy. For those of you who have been in the financial crime or anti-financial crime world, and for sure have, have heard about uh, GFI for a long time. They have produced magnificent, uh, outstanding reports and news on, 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 on items, on information to control, combat, and prevent financial crime. And they will be presenting today the latest the latest uh, report, Financial Crime in Latin America and the Caribbean, Understanding Country Challenges and Designing Effective Technical Responses. So I invite, we invite you, if you have any question, if you have any comment, you can send us all those questions, all those comments through the chat here at uh, Zoom, you have it down there. Also, for those of you, who want to listen this in English or in Spanish, you have two, you have also there at the bottom of the page, the interpretation uh, switch that you can, you can hear this in English or in Spanish, depending what is your preference. So it is an honor to be participating in the launching of this magnificent, outstanding report that I am eager to go through once this is over, but our, 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 uh, no, the staff from GFI will present it uh, today. Before the, we present the, the people, the professionals from GFI, let me, it is an honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, Senator uh, Ryan Pinder, who is the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs for the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, having been appointed in September 20th this year after the general elections were held in the Bahamas and the Progressive Liberal Party were voted in as the government. Upon his appointment to Attorney General, Senator Pinder took over the chairmanship of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. Senator Pinder is the former member of parliament for the Elizabeth constituency and the Minister of Financial Services and Trade in the former Progressive Liberal Party government. Before becoming the Attorney General, Senator Pinder was a partner in a leading law firm in the Bahamas in, the, in its commercial and financial service practice group. His practice focused on private client, client planning and structures and regulatory and licensing matters for financial services institutions. As a commercial attorney, he represented commercial interests in the hospitality and real estate developments in front of the government and regulatory bodies in securing the necessary approvals to do business in the Bahamas. In this capacity, he represented some of the largest hotels and real estate development projects in the Bahamas. Senator Pinder is admitted to the Bahamas Bar and, has, and was admitted to the Florida Bar as a board certified as a tax attorney. He received his Bachelor and Master of Business Administration, Juris Doctor, as well as Master of Law in International Taxation from the University of Miami. It is an honor, Senator Pinder, to have you here today to to open this this presentation welcome thank you very much and thank you for that introduction and i welcome all of the participants guests and certainly uh, I, I i i welcome my participation as the incoming attorney general of the bahamas and the chairman of, of cfata uh, so certainly it's a good morning to all uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to address you today at this event to publish the global financial integrities report on financial crime in Latin America and the Caribbean. 
I would like to start by congratulating the GFI and the authors of the report mm -hmm. who have created a useful document that will assist all of us and all of those involved in combating financial crimes. The report comprehensively reviews and examines criminal activity occurring through the crimes and drug trafficking, mineral trafficking, human trafficking, and migrant smuggling, and also the financial crimes of money laundering, trade-based money laundering, and certainly terrorism financing and corruption. The CFAT have welcomed the opportunity to participate in this GFI venture and notes the impressive number of participating countries, 33, and participants, 250 plus individuals and entities. Uh, that's certainly a large number and something to be proud of uh, in producing such a comprehensive report. The level of participation is significant because it shows that the region understands the need to address these types of criminal activities in order to counteract or uh, counter money laundering and terrorist financing and other financial crimes to achieve compliance with international standards that have been set by the FATF. A review of the report shows that regionally, we have laws to address money laundering, terrorist financing, trade-based money laundering, corruption, human trafficking and smuggling and mineral trafficking. Uh, I know from the Bahamas point of view, but certainly for the entire region, we have all worked extremely hard in the recent years to upgrade our laws, to make them uh, compliant with international best practices and to ensure as a region, we are viewed as a region that takes financial crime seriously. There's also a high level of ratif ratification of relevant treaties to address these crimes that us, us countries in the region have been part of. We therefore have some strong legal frameworks, which we need to continually effectively implement, not only for domestic purposes, but also to facilitate international cooperation throughout Latin America and the Caribbean and beyond. Certainly in our region, in Latin America and Caribbean, we as countries frequently do business together and have clients uh, from throughout the region. And so, so, so understanding the inclusiveness of our region and the cooperation of our region, uh, is exceptionally important. Through a review of the country summaries in the report, it, is, it reflects some common issues that can be facilitated by cooperation and collaboration. We are all brothers in this region and sisters in this region, and we should work together in collaboration to achieve the end goal. These crimes are of global significance, and we can certainly play a strategic role in fighting these crimes at all levels, domestically, regionally, and internationally and, and, and certainly across the globe. Many of us here uh, that are represented, uh, especially in CFATF, uh, are, are small nation states with limited resources um, and, and we have financial and other issues that we have addressed that have all been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but we must continue to persevere for the sake of our societies. Uh, in doing so, we also must continue to realize um, that the damage done by COVID-19 will take a collective effort uh, to come out of. We all have strengths and we all have our own weaknesses and we can therefore aim to share our strengths and in doing so, hopefully diminish some of the weaknesses that each and every one of us may have through collaboration and collective effort. I think we are stronger when we are united. This report represents an excellent guide as to not only what our challenges are and how we have addressed them, but it will also allow us to learn from each other what has worked in other areas and what we can do to improve ourselves domestically and regionally. The recommendations provided are comprehensive and will certainly assist in addressing aspects of the criminal and financial crimes that are the focus of the report. The report also allows our regional donors and those that provide technical assistance to focus on areas where we most need assistance in curbing financial crimes and illicit flows uh, of funds. As I mentioned, many of us are small developing states. Uh, many of us have, uh, have, have challenges um, that we have to face on a daily basis. And this collaboration and technical assistance from our partners, I think will go a long way. There's a lot of work to be done in the region to continuously curb the financial crimes of money laundering, mineral smuggling, corruption, and human trafficking and smuggling. As chairman of CFATF, I can state that we will continue to play our part to ensure that our members address 
address these financial crimes and confiscate the illicit funds that are generated from them. We stand ready and willing to continue partnerships with the UNODC, the OAS, CARICOM, and our Latin American counterpart, GAFALAT, and others to keep our region focused on raising public awareness and sharing of information between our law enforcement and other competent authorities to achieve a higher level of success in limiting these criminal activities. Again, through cooperation amongst ourselves, we believe that we can tackle these, these uh, issues of financial crimes. In closing, I wish to sincerely thank the Global Financial Integrity uh, for this stellar report that will allow us all to review, reflect, and move forward better equipped to facilitate the challenges to address financial crimes in Latin America and Caribbean. Our economies and our countries will only be strong if we demonstrate a commitment to integrity and a commitment to, to law and order. And this extends, of course, into what the topics in the GFI report and certainly matters of financial crimes. So I wanna thank everybody for the opportunity to just bring these brief remarks. Uh, I know we have a full day and then we have a full analysis on a very comprehensive and very large report. Uh, and I look forward to, to hearing the presentations by our panelists. Again, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to participate and certainly thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself as chairman of CFADA and the, the new attorney general of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I wish everybody a good day. Excellent. Thank you very much, Senator Pinder, uh, for, for, your, for your welcome words. And it is an honor to have or be working near hand in hand with the CFTF and this, 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 this so, so global organizations in charge of establishing certain the, the standards uh, to combat and control money laundering and other financial, financial crimes. Um, let me go and introduce the professional, the people behind the force behind this report, this magnificent, outstanding report, and behind the work at Global Financial Integrity that are and will be presenting today today report. Uh, we have Channing Mavrelis, who is the Global Financial Integrity's Illicit Trade Director. She focuses on the intersection of illicit financial flows, transnational crime, and international trade. Uh, Channing has over a decade of experience working on issues related to AML CFT and has been conducting data-driven analysis of illicit trade and trade-related IFF since joining GFI in 2013. Prior to joining GFI, Mrs. Mavrelis worked in banking and has taught in South Korea and Morocco. Also is with us our friend Lakshmi Kumar, who is the policy director at GFI with several years of experience working on issues of financial policy, securities investigation, regulatory governance, anti-corruption and anti-money laundering terrorist financing. Before joining GFI, Kumar was a lawyer and policy professional in India, working with governments and regulatory agencies across South Asia, East Africa to investigate money laundering and terrorist financing, financing risk to their financial systems. Also our friend, Julia Jansura, who is the program manager, Latin America and the Caribbean for GFI. She coordinates projects and partnerships in the region that promotes transparency, security, and economic development. Her specific research interests include remittances, de-risking, informality, and financial inclusion. Prior to joining GFI, Julia conducted research on remittances, migration, and economic development at the Inter-American Inter Dialogue at Washington, D.C.-based think tank. Last but not least, Claudia Helm, who is a research associate in the Latin America and the Caribbean program for GFI. Claudia is primarily part of a project that analyzes corruption and financial crimes in Latin America and the Caribbean. Her interests include corruption, security, democracy, and women empowerment in the Western Hemisphere. Prior to joining GFI, Claudia worked for several years at the OAS in the Department of Electorate Cooperation and Observation.
having introduced our professionals from GFI, I, I give them the, the microphone, the, the floor to, to present. So good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to have you all join us uh, today to, to share this report. It's something we're extremely proud of. Um, I think it comes as no surprise uh, to everyone here that countries in Latin America and the Caribbean face a complex, dynamic, and challenging financial landscape. The same security threats that make the region one of the most violent in the world also generate large amounts of illicit proceeds, which are subsequently laundered back into the region's economies and often are used to perpetuate further violence and insecurity. Countries in the region face a daunting task, task in effectively responding. So this project uh, provides a comprehensive in-depth analysis of financial crime and uh, crime threats in 33 Latin American countries. And it includes a country by country overview that lays out the scope of financial crimes, the main threats facing each country, and the effectiveness of the current national anti money laundering and counterterrorism financing or AML CFT response. There are six case studies that exemplify some of the financial crime methodologies used, such as the black market peso, peso exchange, corruption, and mineral trafficking. <clears throat> There's an analysis of four illicit economies that generate criminal proceeds regionally, drug trafficking, mineral trafficking, corruption, and trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. There's a regional overview of four specific financial crime types, money laundering, trade-based money laundering, terrorism financing, and corruption, as well as an analysis of efforts to address these financial crimes, including programming efforts such as technical assistance programs, as well as a mapping of relevant national laws and international treaties. Next slide, please. For this massive undertaking, GFI carried out 250 interviews with subject matter experts from government, civil society, the private sector, and international organizations. Our analysis of financial crime threats, channels, routes, and facilitators, as well as our assessment of the effectiveness of current national AML CFT efforts includes the results of these interviews. In addition, GFI analyzed other materials regarding financial crimes, including national risk assessments and mutual evaluation reports by the FATF and regional bodies such as GAFRILAT and CFATF. Furthermore, GFI reviewed national legislation and international treaties on financial crimes and illicit economies. We mapped and analyzed current interventions to combat financial crimes, including donor technical assistance programs, initiatives by international organizations, and regional or national efforts led by countries in the region. We used a variety of quantitative methodologies to estimate the scope of financial crimes. For national estimates of illicit proceeds, GFI used the 2 to 5% consensus range for criminal proceeds, which has been widely used by organizations such as uh, the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, UNODC, and the FATF. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to take you more in depth into the report. Thank you, Channing. I'm going to switch to Spanish to have a bit of a, a balance in language, and so if you need translation, that is available. Como parte de ese proyecto, buscamos identificar cuáles son aquellos delitos financieros que más afectan la región, cómo se mueve este dinero sucio a través de las economías y quiénes están involucrados eh, a nivel regional en estos delitos financieros. Eh, sacamos ese análisis hablando con más de 250 expertos de los países de la región. Primero, eh, les pedimos identificar cuáles son aquellos delitos financieros que más afectan sus países. Eh, como podemos ver a nivel regional, la corrupción fue el primer delito financiero que más afecta toda la región. Le sigue el lavado de activos. En segundo lugar, el lavado de activos basado en el comercio. En tercer lugar, y el financiamiento de terrorismo. En cuarto lugar. Claramente hay diferencias interesantes a nivel de subregión eh, que podemos observar también. También les preguntamos a los expertos identificar eh, principales fuentes de ingresos ilícitos eh, que ven en sus diferentes países de la región. Eh, lo que podemos observar aquí es que en la región eh, en general, eh, la principal fuente de dinero ilícito es la corrupción. Le sigue el tráfico eh, de drogas. En segundo lugar, el eh, trata de personas y tráfico de inmigrantes. En tercer lugar, 
y el tráfico de minerales en cuarto lugar. Obviamente también podemos observar diferencias interesantes a nivel de las subregiones. En el caso de Centroamérica, por ejemplo, eh, la principal fuente de ingresos ilícitos es el tráfico de drogas. También les preguntamos acerca de los principales facilitadores que están involucrados en estos delitos financieros. Eh, prestando el, eh, el término de, de GAFI, los gatekeepers, ¿no? Esas son eh, personas o profesiones que podemos imaginar como eh, en las puertas del sistema financiero y ellos deciden quién puede tener acceso y quién no. Pueden ser eh, profesiones como eh, abogados, notarios, eh, consultores, por ejemplo. Eh, lo que observamos es que eh, hay diferencias interesantes a nivel de las diferentes subregiones, pero por lo general los abogados y los notarios son los principales facilitadores involucrados en ese tipo de delito financiero. Esto según las más de 250 entrevistas llevadas a cabo para este proyecto. También tratamos de identificar los principales canales utilizados para mover dinero ilícito de una jurisdicción a, a otra. Obviamente, identificar los canales utilizados es clave para luego poder eh, crear eh, una respuesta de prevención eh, adecuada. ¿no? Entonces, tenemos que primero eh, tener ese diagnóstico de cómo se mueve el dinero ilícito para luego diseñar intervenciones efectivas. ¿no? Eh, lo que observamos es que aunque hay diferencias eh, en las diferentes subregiones, por lo general hay cuatro grandes canales a nivel de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Y estos son, primero, instituciones financieras. Esto no es gran sorpresa porque obviamente hay muchos activos y mucho dinero en estas instituciones financieras. ¿no? Eh, eh, otro canal que vemos que es muy prevalente a nivel regional es bienes raíces, ¿verdad? Y si no han visto, les invito a ver eh, un nuevo informe de GFI que publicamos acerca del lavado de activos basado en, en bienes raíces. Otro canal que es muy importante y muy prevalente a nivel regional es el comercio internacional. Aquí vemos, por ejemplo, el papel de la facturación fraudulenta el lavado de activos basado en el comercio internacional. Y por último, es importante eh, mencionar el nivel de contrabando de efectivo a granel o el bulk cash smuggling. Esto también es uno de los canales eh, principales. También eh, en el transcurso de las entrevistas que hicimos, les preguntamos a, a los expertos ¿Cómo califican el esfuerzo nacional en prevención del lavado y otros delitos financieros? Eh, aquí eh, las respuestas son muy, muy interesantes. Eh, generalmente lo que podemos observar es que las áreas más fuertes eh, son prevención e investigación de delitos financieros y que las áreas más débiles eh, tienden a ser eh, enjuiciamiento ¿verdad? Eh, de estos casos. Y esto lo podemos observar también cuando miramos los diferentes casos, los diferentes procesos judiciales, ¿verdad? Y vemos que eh, a nivel regional hay muy pocas condenas por delitos financieros, ¿verdad? Eh, sabemos que hay investigaciones, eh, sabemos que hay, hay casos, pero no siempre llevan a, a enjuiciamiento, no siempre llevan a, a condenas. También les preguntamos a las personas eh, durante el proceso de, de entrevistas cómo ellos califican los esfuerzos de su propio país en cuanto a hacer frente a los delitos financieros. Eh, esta calificación en realidad refleja la percepción de quienes viven en este país y quienes trabajan en prevención de delitos financieros en este país. No necesariamente refleja eh, la percepción de, de GFI, ¿verdad? Ni de los autores de, de este informe. Sin embargo, sí es interesante ver cuál es la percepción, ¿verdad? De la efectividad de, de la Estrategia Nacional de Prevención del Lavado y Otros Delitos Financieros. Aquí podemos ver las respuestas en una escala de 1 a 5. 
donde uno representa eh, una respuesta débil, ¿verdad? Y cinco eh, refleja eh, una respuesta muy fuerte, ¿verdad? Muy efectiva para controlar delitos financieros. Lo que podemos observar a nivel regional es que el promedio eh, recibido fue solo eh, 2.47 de 5 puntos, ¿verdad? Yo creo que esto refleja que entre eh, muchos de los países de la región hay esta percepción de que tenemos que hacer algo más. Eh, tenemos que fortalecer más nuestro sistema de, de prevención de lavado y, y otros delitos financieros, ¿verdad? Refleja esta percepción de que lo que estamos haciendo actualmente no es suficiente. Tenemos que hacer más. ¿Qué tendrían que hacer los países de la región para fortalecer eh, su trabajo en, en hacer frente a estos delitos financieros? Primero, tendrían que abordar el tema de voluntad política, que es una barrera en muchas de las subregiones. Lo otro que tendrían que hacer es fortalecer la implementación. Observamos que en muchos casos los países tienen buenas leyes y buenas normas en papel pero no siempre se llevan a la implementación, no siempre se implementan al, al 100%. Lakshmi. Thank you, Julia, for that. Um, I have the pleasure of now talking about the first of our four different financial crimes. Now, when we talk about money laundering, I think, you know, we have such a great expert audience before us, we can slice it in several ways. I would encourage everyone here to look at our report because it's filled with rich detail, but for the purposes of um, this presentation, I'm going to look at it through four different lenses. The first of which is, what role does the region, the LAC region, play in money laundering? Does it act as source, transit, or destination? And the truth is, much like everywhere else in the world, all the countries in the LAC region also take on the role of source, transit, and destination for money laundering. And this is because the, the region is complex in, ter in, in terms of the types of economies that it represents. So you have high income, low income, and middle income. And so therefore, they all take on the role. And again, this turn is therefore then in reflected in the types of channels that are used to money launder. And you can see from this chart we did, which is sort of a compilation of our 250 interviews, that it cuts across a whole host of channels and there's a wide diversity. But what this also, what is positive about this is you see that the high risk channels, including real estate, remittances, free trade zones, stocks, offshore accounts, those are also high risk channels that we see elsewhere in the world, which tells you that the solutions to address money laundering are really about more greater cooperation because the same channels used in the LAC region are used in Africa, they're used in Asia. And so trying to see how we can weave together more cooperation is really the answer. At the same time, we saw some things that were unique. Um, the mentions of sort of cattle ranching or rural land or sports associations, horse racing, some of those are a little more unique and not necessarily reflective of other parts and ensuring that there is enough attention paid to those channels is also equally important. Um, can we move to the next slide? Now, once we've sort of talked about these two things, the other big thing I would say is the, is the challenges that we have. Um, the challenges that we have really can be split into um, four distinct categories. Now, the first of which is that AML laws in the region are relatively recent. In many cases, they've only started, um, they've only started in the last, 10 years, which means they are very much still trying to catch up and figure out how to do this. There is not as much institutional knowledge, unlike what we see in the US and elsewhere. Um, the other next challenge that we see is that the focus on US drug in the US has been primarily on drug trafficking. This has been a double-edged sword for the LAC region. Now, what I would say is that while it has proved beneficial, our expert interviews really talked about at the same time that it was incredibly restrictive and it didn't allow resources to focus on other crimes that were just as important, which you can see in the multivarious channels that we've seen. Third was the issue of the mutual legal assistance process. As you know, money laundering is a cross-border issue. Because it is a cross-border crime, 
cooperation is important. A lot of our experts talked about how the foundational block for cooperation, which is the MLAC process, was incredibly limited in how effective it could be. And this was several reasons. For example, between the US and the region as a whole, there were sometimes language challenges. A lot of countries were civil law versus common law. Uh, there were different evidentiary standards. And finally, and perhaps most interestingly, while in all of this is the relationship that the US has with the region, in that we clearly see money leaving the region and therefore there's a question about the money laundering controls. But also, perhaps concerningly, there is the fact that the U.S. continues to be a safe haven. All of the money that we see leave the region comes and finds a home in the U.S., whether it's to real estate, whether it's to the use of U.S. corporation services. So unless we figure out that relationship, figuring out the issues with financial crime and criminal activity doesn't work unless the U.S. also has an equal part to play in it. And lastly, we can't talk about money laundering without talking about beneficial ownership. And if you see this beautiful graphic we have here on the right, and there are several others like it, there is, there is a much better development of money laundering or beneficial ownership registries in the region than in the US. But even within that, we see sort of four distinct buckets, countries that have not yet committed, countries that are committing to pass the laws, and those that have a public and private registry. And the biggest thing before I conclude is that for to make this effective, there has to be a uniform way of exchanging information between them. But I will stop here, hand it over to my uh, colleague, Chani. Of course, it's only been two years, can't turn off the mute button. Um, so overall, uh, experts interviewed for this project perceived TBML to be on the rise in Latin America and the Caribbean. And drug trafficking was the most common criminal activity linked to TBML. I'm going to discuss one emerging threat as well as two challenges that seemed most salient to me. One of the emerging threats in the region is the increased involvement of Chinese professional money laundering networks, particularly involving the US and Mexico and Colombia. TBML typologies have often been discussed in a two country scenario where the criminal proceeds in the destination country, such as the country where uh, narcotics are sold, are repatriated, repatriated to the source country, that is the country where the drug trafficking organization or DTO, um, or where the, the goods uh, have been uh, cultivated. With the increased involvement of Chinese professional money laundering networks, a third jurisdiction, China, has entered into the, a, the equation. In this three country scenario, individuals in China purchase the criminal proceeds in the destination country, for example, the US. And in return, they make an equivalent amount of Chinese yuan available to individuals in the source country, let's say Mexico, so that individuals and businesses in Mexico can purchase goods in China. These goods are then exported to Mexico and sold with the proceeds in Mexican pesos given back to the drug trafficking organization. In fact, the US 2020 National Risk Assessment noted the increase in complex mo uh, money laundering schemes involving Chinese citizens residing in the US who, acting as peso brokers, laundered drug-related cash proceeds via black market peso exchange schemes in order to re repatriate money to Mexico. There is a symbiotic relationship between TBML and inform informal currency exchange. TBL, TBML schemes allow criminals to re, repatriate proceeds, as well as allow individuals in one country, such as China or Colombia, to access foreign currency, that is US dollars, without having to move money or go through formal channels, avoiding potential restrictions or steep exchange rates and fees. For these networks, engaging in such schemes is not only a tried and true way to launder money, it is also a method for evading China's capital controls. This relationship is likely to grow in coming years as Beijing re recently announced its plans to address the country's growing inequality through wealth redistribution by, among other measures, targeting the country's super rich to reasonably adjust excessive incomes. In regards to challenges, the principal vulnerability to TBML in the region is that it is not well understood even by financial crime uh, experts. The interviews as well as research left me with the impression that we, as a financial crime or transnational crime community, are not all on the same page. Some experts we spoke to falsely conflated TBML with the use of trade misinvoicing or the smuggling of legal goods, such as cigarettes, in order to evade customs and taxes. Others talked in essence about TBML, 
specifically using criminal proceeds to purchase legal goods that were smuggled cross border and sold as a mechanism to le legitimize the funds, but not, did not specifically use the term or seem to understand they were describing TDML. In addition, speaking with experts, you get the sense that TDML is this nebulous activity. There's an overall consensus that it is a very prominent methodology, um, but there weren't many specifics in terms of the magnitude or the actors involved, common typologies, impacted jurisdictions, et cetera. Finally, this is something not just confined to the Latin American and Caribbean region, but something, an, a, a global issue, but definitely plays out here as well. And that is that much of the global AML CFT regime has largely focused on efforts to guard the formal financial system and to a lesser extent, combat currency smuggling with little to a little attention paid to the international trade system. Up until the last five or so years, coverage by TDML by both domestic and international policymakers was uh, was rather lacking. Um, and it was only recently that that FATF uh, last year updated issued an updated TDML report. Though, even with this updated report, one shortcoming that still exists in the FATF's response is that none of its 40 recommendations specifically focus on the trade sector or on combating TBML. In regards to the financial sector, one of the largest challenges is that financial institutions have very limited visibility over trade transactions. According to the Wolfsburg Group, globally, only 20% of international trade transactions are financed, with the remaining 80% of trade completely completed through open account transactions. As such, banks would not receive any documentary information related to the trade transaction. They would have to rely on traditional AML controls, including know your customer controls, to determine the risk of the transaction. Even if a trade transaction is financed, there is often a disconnect between the AML compliance department and the trade finance department, which typically focuses on detecting sanctioned individuals, entities, or countries, as well as dual use goods, versus detecting or having the training to know how to detect TDML red flags. I'm now going to turn it back to my colleague Julia to talk about terrorism financing. Muchas gracias, Channing. Eh, el otro delito financiero que nosotros analizamos para este proyecto fue financiamiento de terrorismo. Y según las entrevista, eh, entrevistas que hicimos y el análisis eh, que hicimos para el proyecto, eh, la región eh, enfrenta varios retos para poder responder a esta amenaza de, de manera eh, efectiva. Eh, primero, aunque es una región eh, violenta, ¿verdad? Con muchos homicidios intencionales. No es una región que necesariamente enfrenta terrorismo en el día a día, ¿verdad? Esto obviamente es, es una cosa positiva, pero dificulta un poco la implementación de medidas contra el financiamiento del terrorismo. Según varios de los países y según las entrevistas que hicimos, eh, los países tienen las leyes y tienen las normas en papel pero a veces se sienten que no tienen mucha oportunidad para practicar, ¿verdad? Y para asegurar que realmente están funcionando, ¿no? Eh, entonces eso dificulta un poco la, la respuesta regional. Lo otro es que aunque hay un consenso claro sobre qué es lo que es financiamiento de terrorismo, no hay tanto consenso sobre qué cuenta como terrorismo, ¿verdad? Eh, vemos que a nivel regional las definiciones sobre terrorismo son un poco eh, diferentes, ¿verdad? Hay muchas diferencias entre países, eh, las definiciones a veces son políticas, ¿verdad? Eh, contradictorias, a veces hasta eh, no democráticas. Y aquí voy a citar un ejemplo de, de Venezuela, ¿verdad? Que por ejemplo eh, ha designado a grupos de oposición democrática como grupos terroristas, ¿verdad? Esto es un muy buen ejemplo eh, del tipo de, de problema que, que vemos. Obviamente, esto no es el uso adecuado del término de, de terrorismo y dificulta mucho la, la implementación efectiva de una política contra financiamiento de terrorismo, ¿verdad? Lo otro que, que dificulta un poco la, la respuesta regional es que la mayoría de los canales utilizados para financiamiento de terrorismo son informales. Entonces, para las autoridades nacionales es difícil poder hacer frente, ¿no? Si los canales son informales, eh, tienen poca eh, habilidad de supervisar o detectar eh, el flujo 
eh, de dinero. ¿no? Los principales canales que nosotros identificamos a través de las entrevistas eh, son contrabando de efectivo a Grenel, remesas informales y comercio internacional informal. ¿verdad? Eh, en cuanto a los facilitadores involucrados en ese tipo de, de delito, eh, debemos mencionar eh, cambistas de dinero informales, ¿verdad? que tienen un rol muy importante que, que jugar. Y por último, debemos mencionar que el financiamiento de terrorismo suele suceder con montos más pequeños de dinero. Esto también es un reto, porque si comparamos con lavado de activos, por ejemplo, esto a veces es con miles de dólares, millones, miles de millones de dólares. ¿no? Son grandes cantidades de dinero, pero financiamiento de terrorismo puede ocurrir con 100 dólares, 1000 dólares. ¿no? Entonces es mucho más difícil detectar por ser montos más pequeños de dinero. Esto no significa que sea imposible de detectar, obviamente, pero sí es un reto para los países eh, de la región. Eh, con esto vamos a mirar nuestro último eh, delito financiero. Eh, Claudia. Perfecto, Julia, muchas gracias. Eh, el crimen financiero uh, que se refiere a la corrupción, en realidad fue un crimen financiero que resaltó en todas las entrevistas, resaltó en todos nuestros análisis y lo hemos definido dentro del reporte como el abuso de poder para beneficio personal. Pero esta definición en realidad es bastante general. Eh, le hemos tratado de, comple de complementar con la definición de FATA, la del Banco Mundial y así distintos entes internacionales. Pero lo que vemos que es muy particular para la región es que se encuentra presente en todos los países. Y vemos que depende mucho del contexto de, del país en sí. Entonces, vemos que hay ciertas circunstancias que definen que un país sea más o menos corrupto. Por ejemplo, los niveles de pobreza la informalidad, la cultura, eh, las necesidades básicas no cubiertas, la falta de educación, eh, salarios bajos. Incluso también vemos que hay ciertos países que no necesariamente quieren caer en la corrupción o quieren hacer prácticas corruptas, sino que son una suerte de víctimas, dado de que por la propia cultura y por el propio tamaño del país, eh, la cantidad de habitantes hace que sea casi inevitable que, por ejemplo, en una misma institución se hagan negocios entre el padre que es dueño de la empresa con un primo que quizás sea ministro. Entonces, vemos que esta dinámica es bastante común, sobre todo en países pequeños. Eh, claramente esto ante ojos internacionales podría ser eh, quizás sesgado como conflicto de intereses o que quizás pueda, pueda darse las circunstancias necesarias para que puedan darse prácticas corruptas. Vemos que a lo largo de la región vemos que la corrupción muchas veces es conocida, incluso tolerada e incluso animada para, para que sea cometida. Dentro del reporte, por favor, el siguiente slide, Julia. Vemos en el reporte que lo hemos definido como tanto un delito financiero y una actividad. ¿Qué sucede? Lo que pasa es que el delito financiero en sí como corrupción puede abordar distintas conductas, por ejemplo, el fraude, el robo, el soborno, la evasión fiscal, eh, malversación de fondos, lavado de dinero y todas estas conductas anexas, pero es mucho más difícil aún identificarlo como actividad ilícita, porque es ahí donde linda con lo inmoral, con lo no ético, Vemos que hay conductas, por ejemplo, como el nepotismo, el clientelismo, eh, la influencia. Entonces, vemos que la corrupción no solo es identificada en, la, en las normas legislativas, sino que también se da a nivel cultural, a nivel práctico. Entonces, vemos más allá de esta definición, que puede ser muy práctica, que las características en sí de los países que cuentan con grandes cantidades de corrupción es de que existe una desigualdad social, eh, las instituciones son debilitadas, eh, hay desconfianza de la sociedad en sí entre los propios ciudadanos, incluso en las propias instituciones, y siempre se fomenta el beneficio privado. Entonces, vimos también que dentro de nuestro análisis, cualquiera puede ser un agente de corrupción, puede ser desde un abogado, un notario, un agente de aduanas, como puede ser también un oficial de mando medio, de mando inicial, entonces, todos en la cadena pueden ser eh, víctimas, pueden ser agentes, promotores de la corrupción. 
Y vemos que a la larga que se siguen promoviendo conductas corruptas, se socava la democracia, eh, la capacidad de los gobiernos para suministrar necesidades básicas y servicios básicos eh, es impactada y no solo eh, va a afectar a las generaciones de ahora, sino también a la capacidad del Estado de proveer servicios de calidad para generaciones futuras. Entonces, si no hay una predictibilidad de cómo se va a actuar y si no hay una guía concreta, eso se vuelve un problema que en realidad debe ser abordado tanto por el gobierno como a nivel regional. Entonces, vemos de que dependiendo de cuánta corrupción hay en el país, puede ser de normal, generalizado, a sistémico. Entonces, vemos también de que parte de las causas de la corrupción es de que existe, por ejemplo, un sector público vulnerable que permite justamente que esas prácticas corruptas crezcan. Eh, quizás no hay una buena preparación. Muchas de las personas con las que conversamos nos dicen que ellos eh, en realidad sí, pues cuentan con las normas eh, y los reglamentos, pero eh, no cuentan con la voluntad política o a veces algunos casos son desestimados. Entonces, esto si se mezcla con con la burocracia, crea la condición perfecta para que se siga cometiendo actos de corrupción. Entonces, ¿cuál es la salida para todo esto? No hay una talla única para todos los países, porque definitivamente hay países que cuentan con mucho más recursos, más conocimiento, más tecnología eh, que otros. Entonces, vemos en realidad de que la iniciativa inicial es no solamente tener una ley vigente, porque vemos que todos los países en realidad cumplen con la normativa de FATA, de los organismos regionales, FAFILA, CIFARA. Ese no es el problema, el problema es la implementación. La implementación porque no hay una conexión de lo que sucede realmente en el país y lo que existe en esa norma. Entonces, es necesario voluntad política, es necesario de que hay una conexión entre el sector privado, la sociedad y el sector público para que al final los resultados sean los deseados que generalmente son los que están en la ley, pero no hay, hay un impedimento eh, que es multisectorial, es multifactorial. Entonces, eh, lo primero que hay que hacer en realidad en los países es justamente investigar qué es lo que está sucediendo, con qué recursos se cuenta, tener un poder judicial empoderado, que no tenga una carga jurídica de, de décadas, en realidad hay casos que no, no tienen sentencias. Eh, también lo que promovemos como GFI es que existe mucho más transparencia y intercambio de información entre las propias instituciones para que puedan conversar entre ellas, puedan intercambiar información y así perseguir los casos de corrupción y prevenir sobre todo eh, estas conductas corruptas que afectan no solo al país, sino también a nivel regional. Eh, parte de las medidas que promovemos es no solo trabajar a nivel país, sino con los vecinos, socios comerciales, entes internacionales, por ejemplo, con como Gafilat, OECD, eh, la OEA, eh, Edmund, Edmund Group, donde todas lo, los, las unidades de inteligencia puedan trabajar juntas. Entonces vemos que es un esfuerzo conjunto. Hasta ahí llegamos con corrupción. Lakshmi, pasamos a la siguiente temática. Thank you, Claudia. Um... First, I just want to apologize if I was slightly distracted. I had a small issue with um, Zoom, but I promise you everything that I did say in the presentation is provided in glorious detail in the report itself in a rather concise 15-page chapter. Um, Tori did a fantastic job of covering this. She very eloquently said corruption is both a financial crime and criminal activity. And I'm going to talk about the next criminal activity that we've looked at, which is mineral trafficking. I'm sure to many of you that are sitting here today, this has become a fairly important issue right before the pandemic and through the pandemic because of the attention that's been placed on gold. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, I really want to focus on a couple of things. The first, which is when we say mineral trafficking, what does it mean? What does it encompass? What stage of the process? When does it start? Does it sort of cover just the, the point of extraction? Does it cover the point of export? Does it cover licensing? And then what else is included when we talk about mineral trafficking? Now, the truth is when we say the word mineral trafficking, there is no internationally accepted term for what is mineral trafficking. It encompasses everything from gold to iron to coal, because all of them in some form are minerals. 
Now, additionally, what it also includes, and it's not explicitly included, but because it involves every stage of the process from contracting to licensing to environmental impacts, because there can be corruption or illicit activity that allows you to gain a profit margin through this. So you also have the issue of environment that, that is folded into it and environmental damage and the profits from environmental damage. The next thing is, especially in the region, land ownership is particularly complex. And there are both sort of historic and cultural reasons for why the issues of land ownership are deeply tied into the problems and the, the problems around minerals acting as a source of financial crime or acting as a source of illicit financial flows. Because again, as, we've, as, we, as, as we found during our work is that there is both horizontal and vertical land ownership, meaning that you know, someone can own the surface, but doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you own the resources under it. And this has been fraught with problems. And the last thing is that depending on where technical assistance is coming from, sometimes it can be entirely national security focused when the assistance is coming from the US. And in other times it can be really through the lens of environmental damage. And that in turn affects the ability to how you prosecute and address this. The second issue is because the focus has been so much on gold, it has excluded so many other extractive commodities. We saw 16 other extractive commodities in the region that were high risk and susceptible for acting as a source of criminal activity. And more importantly, we saw illicit financial flows flowing through the use of these sectors. Now, great examples with this are, um, can you just switch to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, important examples in this we saw were, for example, there's Jade in Guatemala, which is a source of um, revenue for groups, which is not yet explored. Similarly, in Venezuela, so much attention has been paid to the use of by the Maduro regime of gold. But the country also has naturally occurring sources of uranium, coltan, bauxite, all of which we have reports. And if you look at our report, we have divided by country. You can see the different geographic routes that different extractive commodities take when they are being used as mechanisms for illicit activity. Colombia, emeralds was something that a lot of attention which was paid to at the height of the problems with FARC. It's dropped off through the radar and there are still important questions around it. Copper and Haiti. There are also questions around sort of undeveloped resources that we have seen. For example, lithium, which is, is worth billions of dollars and is found in Bolivia, Argentina, Argentina, and Chile, which is expected to provide a lot of resources, but there are still questions about its rich potential for um, corruption. And if you look at our report, which I highly encourage you to see, you can see how much more commodities exist and sometimes the attention of gold is taken away from the easy use of these other extractive commodities to facilitate crime. Finally, once again, for those that are interested, I do want to point out that we have seen that the flows of gold are incredibly interesting and varied, but the solutions really to mineral trafficking and addressing it as a problem remain ensuring that there are equal number of resources, not just for gold, but for the other commodities that are valuable revenue sources for the region. Um, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Channing, with that. Next slide, please. Oh, already there. So uh, talking about drug trafficking, it's one of the largest generators of criminal proceeds and in conjunction with corruption and money laundering presents arguably the greatest challenge to the region. There is a strong symbiotic relationship between drug trafficking and financial crimes, as drug proceeds are frequently laundered, but can also be used for terrorism financing, while corruption is typically a critical component in facilitating trafficking. In addition, drug trafficking often gives way to other transnational crimes, such as human trafficking and illegal mining. Drug trafficking is a long-standing, deeply rooted activity in the region. So there are consistent trends largely related to cultivation, as well as newer trends related to supply and consumption. For the sake of time, I will highlight a few newer trends. First, Mexico's supply of cannabis to the US has decreased due to the growth of legalized and decriminalized cannabis across the US. One expert noted that it formerly represented anywhere from 40 to 60% of the cannabis sold in the US. Inversely, Mexico is now uh, the largest source of methamphetamine consumed in the US in comparison to domestic production. Due to its high purity and low price, 
which Mexican drug trafficking organizations are able to do through low production costs. Experts noted that fentanyl has been a game changer, principally for Mexico and the US. It has not bled out too much into other countries. Fentanyl was largely arriving in the US either directly from China in small quantities by international mail or from China via Mexico into large, in larger quantities. Over the last two or so years, there's been a marked decrease in direct imports from China as Mexican DTOs have begun importing the precursor chemicals required to make fentanyl from China and synthesize it on their own. Domestic consumption of drugs besides cannabis had been relatively low throughout the region. However, the last 10 years, the trade and consumption of kind of quote new drugs or newer use drugs, particularly synthetics like methamphetamine and ecstasy has increased in certain countries. One expert noted that Brazil is the epicenter for the import of synthetics, particularly party drugs from Europe that are destined for Chile and Argentina, which have strong middle classes with greater disposable incomes. Now, it's probably no surprise that uh, no method or channel is off limits for narcotics related money laundering. However, popular methods often involve some of the following, including, again, TDML and the black market pe uh, peso exchange in particular, which has been a tried and true method. Uh, professional money launderers, as I, I mentioned earlier, this Chinese connection, uh, both playing a pivotal role in the flow of synthetics into the region, as well as facilitating money laundering. Uh, and as Lakshmi highlighted, um, gold, uh, or as well as kind of any precious metals or stones, narcotics proceeds can be invested into mining operations in order to launder the money. They can be used to purchase gold, either gold that's legally or illegally mined directly. What was uh, stuck out to me um, very, very much was that in Suriname, the government transferred the authority of valuation and tax collection of gold exports from the Central Bank of Suriname to the private company Colote Suriname Mint House, or KSMH. The government reportedly owns 10%, 30% is owned by former president Guterres via straw purchasers, and the remaining 60% is owned by Coloti Precious Minerals, or sorry, Precious Metals, a UAE-based UAE global company plagued by accusations of laundering billions of dollars in gold. Since KSMH's formation, it has been alleged that the refinery only exists on paper for the purpose of certifying real and non-existent gold shipments. As Suriname is a transit point for gold and cocaine, this provides a handy avenue for money laundering. In addition to, depending on the type of money laundering, the flow of proceeds back to the source country can mirror the path of the narcotics. For example, in Dominica, cocaine uh, coming from Venezuela and other parts of South America transits Dominica while on its way to the nearby French overseas departments of Martinique and Guadeloupe before moving onward to Europe. Experts reported that corresponding pr criminal proceeds, often euros, return along that same route. Now, the policy and law enforcement response to drug trafficking has largely followed this war on drugs narrative, which is typically focused on the interdiction of drugs, traffickers, and facilitators with less emphasis on the criminal proceeds. The success from this approach typically, typically occurs in what I would call a piecemeal fashion. Uh, the number of drugs and funds seized, the number of individuals arrested, of cases prosecuted, and largely have not had a strong systemic impact on the underlying conditions, things like poverty, violence, corruption, weak institutions, et cetera, that drive and or facilitate drug trafficking. Crop eradication and crop substitution programs have been prevalent in producer countries, either initiate, initiated by the countries themselves, as well as with foreign support. However, the success of these programs has overall been underwhelming. And while cultivation may be re, uh, reduced, sometimes significantly, it often does not have the desired impact on the market. Crop substitution programs were viewed by some experts as a legitimately viable option to combat illicit crop cultivation. However, it is absolutely critical, critical to provide long-term, as in decades long, for alternative development programs. Finally, the majority of countries in the LAC region seem to struggle to include meaningful financial investigations into drug, ca uh, drug trafficking cases, meaning that law enforcement is unable to completely understand and therefore dismantle criminal networks. Even if a country does have the technical capacity to pursue money laundering cases, the government may choose to drop the money laundering charge in order to secure a conviction or guilty plea for drug trafficking, or choose to file a lesser charge in its place. For example, 
Colombian prosecutors reportedly will often choose to prosecute an individual for the charge of illicit enrichment rather than money laundering as it has a lower burden of proof. I'm gonna turn it back now to my colleague, Julia, to talk about trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. Muchas gracias, Janine. Eh, otro delito que nosotros analizamos eh, fue la trata de personas y el tráfico ilegal de migrantes. Eh, fue muy interesante eh, durante las entrevistas porque algo que, que observamos es que se sabe muy poco del lado financiero eh, de estos problemas, ¿verdad? Por ejemplo, hablando con autoridades nacionales, expertos en el tema, eh, casi no se sabe mucho de eh, los flujos financieros ilícitos que están detrás, ¿verdad? Del atrato o bien del, del tráfico de, de migrantes. Esto es un enorme reto, ¿verdad? Y realmente eh, sería importante fortalecer eh, esfuerzos de investigación, eh, estudio para mejor comprender eh, la parte financiera, ¿verdad? De, de estos delitos. Lo otro que, que creo que es un poco complicado es que aunque eh, la trata y el tráfico en teoría son eh, fenómenos distintos, en la realidad eh, no es tan sencillo, ¿verdad? Vemos casos, por ejemplo, en que migrantes eh, contratan a un coyote, ¿verdad? Con la voluntad de, de migrar, pero terminan siendo victimizados eh, por redes de, de trata de Okay, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll push on um, and get to the conclusions and recommendations. Um, and then if we can get Julia back online um, and we have some time left, um, we will um, uh, get back to the tip and song. So what we're gonna do next is um, let's have uh, uh, Lakshmi um, talk about some of these conclusions and recommendations um, and, and we'll move from there. Thank you, um, thank you, Channing. Um, I feel confident that Julia will be back with us very shortly. But with the exception of what we just spoke about, what, and which I know we will come back to, what we saw was that the solutions really to tackle the financial crimes that we identified and the criminal activities that we looked at are by no means simple. They have a deep intrinsic connection to the ongoing issues in the region, whether it is in the quality, violence, um, the lack of institutional, not weak institutions, institutional knowledge. And I think most fundamentally, as Claudia mentioned, the issues with corruption. What, I'm, what must be underscored is that there was nearly a universal appreciation for the technical assistance programs that the US government had provided. And another thing that I think was incredibly valuable for us was the degree, the sophisticated, the high level of understanding that experts throughout the region had of the problems that the region faces, what the possible solutions are, what the risks are, what needs to be done to do better, and also a, an eagerness and willingness to sort of want to contribute. And I think that that shows that there, there's a lot to be hopeful for. Um, finally, I think before we sort of go into the main recommendations, it is that Financial crime and criminal activity are not standalone issues. They exist very much in a world and they are symptomatic of the problems with governance, rule of law, democracy, and corruption that the region faces. Therefore, any future technical assistance program has to not treat them as separate, but really marry them. Um, next slide, please. And if we are talking about what our recommendations, I will emphasize that we have country specific recommendations, recommendations for each financial crime and each criminal activity. But if we really have to talk about what are big thematic areas where we see things that need to be done, um, first and foremost is that, as I mentioned, there's universal appreciation for what the technical assistance programs have done. However, the one thing that we kept coming back to was the fact that the beneficiaries of the program very often are going back to the same environments where there are 
political pressures not to do cases, there are low wages, there are issues with corruption, and building those challenges in and how to address them into the technical assistance program is a necessary component because otherwise you provide training, but the training is often meaningless because the opportunities um, to do that are not as plentiful. I see that my colleague um, Julia is back, so I'm happy um, if she's okay to hand it over to her um, and then um, uh, and then f finish more appropriately when Julia has done and we can truly see the, how everything ties it together. But I will hand it back to my colleague Julia. Thank you, Lakshmi. Muchas gracias. Perdón. Parece que siempre que uno está presentando le cae el internet, ¿no? Eh, sí, como yo les decía, eh, en realidad yo creo que para los países de la región responder a, a los retos del, de la trata y del tráfico de migrantes eh, no ha sido fácil. Vemos que en la mayoría de los casos eh, los programas se enfocan en eh, concientización ¿verdad? sobre riesgos de trata o de tráfico de migrantes. Eh, en otros casos, los programas se enfocan en atención eh, inmediata a, a víctimas de trata o de tráfico. Eh, esto es apropiado y es muy importante, pero eh, no se trata de, de responder e investigar las redes financieras detrás de estos fenómenos que en nuestra opinión también sería muy importante, ¿verdad? Eh, otro reto que nosotros observamos es que no hay mucho consenso sobre el papel del, del coyote en el caso de, el, del tráfico de migrantes. Eh, para algunos expertos, eh, ellos consideran que el coyote eh, forma parte o está afiliado a redes criminales más, más grandes. Pero otros expertos consideran que el coyote es un actor eh, individual, ¿verdad? Que está operando eh, pequeñas redes que no necesariamente están conectadas a redes más grandes. Y por último, eh, yo creo que, que un reto ha sido que eh, generalmente redes eh, de trata y redes de tráfico de migrantes tienden a ser muy pequeñas y tienden a ser muy segmentadas. ¿verdad? Es decir, que no cubre, no cubre toda la ruta geográfica, sino que cubre eh, como un pedazo, ¿verdad? Eh, de, del viaje o de la ruta, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, lo que observamos es que el lado financiero también tiende a ser muy segmentado. Estamos hablando de, de pequeñas redes y esto dificulta mucho la detección y la investigación de este tipo de caso por parte de las autoridades. Next slide. Si vemos en la siguiente lámina, eh, nosotros tratamos de calcular la escala del tráfico de migrantes. Eh, estudiamos eh, un, una geografía específica, eh, miramos eh, el valor eh, del tráfico de migrantes entre el Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica y los Estados Unidos. Y haciendo el cálculo, eh, nosotros pensamos que eh, la escala eh, sería aproximadamente 2.7 mil millones de dólares por año. Esto eh, es un monto muy conservador, probablemente tomando en cuenta las olas de migración que hemos visto este año, el valor eh, real sea mayor, ¿no? Pero podemos decir que el, el valor es por encima de 2.7 mil millones de dólares por año, eh, que sería tráfico de inmigrantes entre eh, Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica y los Estados Unidos. Ahora, eh, ¿cuál sería el valor aproximado de eh, envíos eh, entre Estados Unidos y Centroamérica? Eh, nosotros hicimos el cálculo y pens pensamos que el valor eh, de estas transacciones desde Estados Unidos hasta los países del Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica sería por encima de 500 millones de dólares por año. ¿Por qué es menor? Eh, es un monto más pequeño porque obviamente no todos los migrantes llegan ¿verdad? a los Estados Unidos. Y aquí pues, también podemos observar el problema de la deuda ¿verdad? 
del tráfico de, de migrantes. Muchos migrantes son deportados, regresan a sus países de origen con deuda muy grande, ¿verdad? Y esto obviamente también es un factor eh, de vulnerabilidad, ¿verdad? Porque ellos deben grandes cantidades de dinero a redes o a grupos eh, delictivos, ¿no? También podemos observar que parte el del dinero que se paga para tráfico de migrantes va a oficiales corruptos y a grupos de narcotráfico. Entonces aquí en la relación muy importante entre todos esos delitos que hemos venido hablando, ¿verdad? No podemos analizar tráfico de migrantes por sí solo, sino que tenemos que tomar en cuenta cómo se relaciona con otros delitos como la corrupción o el narcotráfico, eh, por ejemplo. Muchas gracias. Eh, creo que podemos pasar. I think that we can uh, conclude that. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very, very, very much, Julia and all of you. We have been receiving plenty of questions as well. I don't know, Channing, if you want to go over the conclusion and recommendation, and then we go over some of the of the questions we, we've been receiving. That's perfect. We'll go to uh, just the next slide and uh, Lakshmi will go over um, our kind of most salient points that we wanted to share. And then we'll head straight into the Q&A and then uh, wrap up with um, uh, some uh, another chemo, uh, chemo, keynote remarks from our uh, from our um, from our friend from Gafi Lab. Thank you, Channing, and um, thank you, um, Julia, for sort of you know beautifully wrapping that up. Um, and as you can sort of tell, that from what Julia sort of you know to tie back what Julia already sort of highlighted is that whether you look at human trafficking, mineral trafficking, drug trafficking, is that they don't exist in silos; they are a product. They are symptomatic of everything, everything else that's happening in the region, whether it's governance challenges and issues. And therefore, when you're talking about technical assistance programs, whether it's to sort of someone at the border, whether it's prosecutors, whether it's judges, accounting for those environmental challenges, uh, rule of law challenges, systemic challenges is important. The second thing is that one, one of the issues that we've really seen is that the, 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 because so much of the focus has been on drug trafficking in terms of how the, U, the US, G, US government has provided technical assistance, the US government's own response to the issue of drug trafficking really needs to take into account that it too is a product of the systemic issues of corruption. And therefore making sure that policy mechanisms and outreach and assistance programs wed the two together is incredibly important. Um, again, another sort of the third thing on this is one of the perhaps a really interesting thing, and this is applicable to most countries in the region, is that there is a tremendous backlog of cases, sometimes going over a decade, a decade and a half. And what this means is that money laundering cases, on um, there is very little impetus to actually move them forward because of this backlog of cases. And it is very, and in, in, in turn, it means that, you know, cases never see the light of the day. So while this is perhaps will in, require more of an investment long-term, there's a lot more to be gained because it would, if there were specialized courts which could fast track cases that deal with financial crimes and associated criminal activities, it ensures that there is a high priority, but also adequate resources provided to make sure that these cases get traction and there is um, in a, there are sufficient penalties for it. Now, fourth, as, I've, as we talked about, the fact that a lot of countries in the region, they are still in the very early stages of implementing all of the, implementing anti-money laundering policies in general, or fi anti-financial crime policies. To fast track it, because the notion of financial crime is not confined by a jurisdiction, at its essence, it is a cross-border issue. And the greatest success stories we've had and the greatest appreciation has come from exchange programs where a DEA official or someone is involved in the MLAT process has been stationed in a country in the region, but also to talk about how this can occur, not just with the US and countries in the region, but between governments in the region as well. Because all of the problems we've seen in terms of the routes, they don't start and, and end in one destination. They go through different countries in the region. Now, finally, as Julia very eloquently identified, the weaponization of the financial of anti-money laundering policy is a huge issue because that is not the purpose of these policies. 
It is being used to target pro-democracy groups, non-profit groups, and therefore, because of the voice that the US has and, uh, and sort of many other member countries that the Gafi Lat has, it is important that during mutual evaluations, these the weaponization or the misuse of AML policies also be identified because otherwise you're shooting yourselves in the foot. The policies that would actually groups would use to support against financial crime and criminal activities, those groups are being taken out of the picture. And therefore sort of addressing that is a real, really key element, but I will stop there and hand it back over to my um, colleague. Excellent, Lakshmir. Um, if, you, if you agree, we can go we can go over some of the of the questions. Very interesting question we've been receiving along the the presentation. Um, I don't know if we will have time to go over all of them, but we will try to to answer some of them at least. Michael asks uh, if you find that red flags for terrorist financing are essentially buried in money laundering detection red flag, or, or basically ignore and he's asking if gfi has any statistics concerning the level of tourist financing in the region or in the world um i don't know if julia channing anyone wants to answer that yeah absolutely um i think i mean i will invite you to read the report where we have a detailed overview of the number of terrorism financing cases um, that are investigated uh, and subsequently prosecuted by country, it is very, very low. Um, I think that yes, there is a problem with um, terrorism financing cases being lost in these much larger, um, at least larger by financial volume uh, money laundering cases. Um, but there's also the issue and keep in mind that many of the channels used for terrorism financing are, are informal, right? So the authorities don't necessarily even have eyes on what's happening, right? How can you, you know, identify red flag indicators um, over an informal transaction, right? That's not even going through sort of the normal uh, system where authorities would have a chance to, to detect it. Um, so these are some of the, the problems that we see. Uh, it's a great question and I definitely invite you to, to check out the full report. Oh, absolutely. And he makes he makes a statement. I personally believe that low amounts ability ability to hide in normal transactions and the focus on money laundering efforts causes any statistic effort impractical. So uh, that to add to your, your to your to what you said, Julia. Now, Patricio is asking, how can technology assist financial institutions in dealing with trade-based money laundering and anti-money laundering in general. Uh, what a key and hot topic now that the FATF has published a couple of, of, of reports on, on technology itself, I, uh, um, uh, um, identification, digital identification, etc. I don't know if anyone has anything to add about that. Sure, definitely. Um, I think I'll kind of break this up in two parts. First is kind of what you can do on the kind of technical or IT side. Um, I think for us, one of the biggest things, the biggest recommendations would be to improve the use of, of the trade data used by the financial institution. Um, GFI has actually developed a program called GF Trade. Um, it's a trade misinvoicing risk assessment tool that helps to kind of answer the question, um, is this price appropriate that, that we're looking at this trade transaction. And this is you know, designed to be used by both customs departments as well as financial institutions. Um, one challenge that we see a lot of times is both, both kind of entities aren't quite sure um, you know, when they're presented with an invoice, be it from an importer or an exporter, how do they verify that price being declared? And we've seen both people from, from financial institutions as well as from, um, from customs departments going to Amazon, going to places like Alibaba, um, going to just using um, not the best resources for determining um, the price. Um, and it can be very hard because at least when it comes to the customs front, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the way it works out with the World Trade Organization and, and valuation rules is it's, it's a bit of a, you know, kind of 
innocent until proven guilty. You have to accept that value until you can find overwhelming evidence or appropriate evidence to prove that the declared value is incorrect. And you have only a certain amount of, of kind of um, wiggle room or steps that you can take to do so. So we highly recommend GF Trade in helping um, you know, both sides know kind of what the left hand is, is, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is, is doing. So helping to know on the import side, um, or if you're looking at, you know, financing an import transaction, what is the average per unit price declared on the export side? Um, and helping to provide that information. Uh, we also use a tool called Pangeva that helps to actually provide transaction level trade data. Um, so where I can see transaction by transaction, depending on the country, um, you know, what companies or individuals have done with particular commodities. Um, both can help you know, again, with the pricing, but whether the commodities and, and the countries involved make sense. Um, going towards kind of training, um, I think this is definitely, it's hard. As I kind of mentioned in my remarks, a lot of it's been focused on kind of the AML red flags in terms of structuring and smurfing and, and different things like that of, of certain kind of kind of very common things to look for, um, both kind of from the front line as well as in integrating into compliance kind of monitoring systems. Um, I think there really needs to be increased cross training between trade finance and, um, you know, AML compliance departments. Um, I think there's there's sometimes a preoccupation, um, you know, or, or, you know, there's a preoccupation on the trade finance department of just identifying whether maybe this is a sound transaction in terms of, you know, any financial risk to, to the financial institution, um, or if it's going to violate any kind of, you know, sanction rules. Um, and a lot of times they need to pull back um, and kind of take a 30,000 look at the transaction. I heard once about a uh, trade finance transaction involving the imports of live cattle from Argentina to Nigeria by a steakhouse that were being moved uh, via airplane. Um, so uh, I don't know if you know, um, but that um, doesn't make any sense. You know, the, the company in, in Nigeria was trying to say that um, they wanted the, the freshest meat um, and they were going to get it um, this way. Uh, however, if you've ever bought an airplane ticket, um, that's an extremely uh, expensive <laughs> way to move goods. Um, you know, ultimately, it took interacting with the AML compliance department to get you know some some common sense into this, and, and the transaction was recommended. One final note on this um, to look out for for early next year: there is the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime. Uh, it's a great coalition of both public, private sector, as well as civil society organizations that GFI is part of. I'm part of this MENA working group, and they're actually working on producing a trade-based financial crime document uh, focused on trade finance and detecting trade-based financial crime uh, for financial institutions. So I, I recommend keeping that on your radar. Thank you so very much, Channing. I mean, we are going over the, the time. I, one, one last question be, before we, we have the final words by, by Gabriela Rodriguez from, from Gafilat. But, but I think this, this issue is key to prevent and combat and control financial crime. It's a question by, by Patricio also. Do you think there is enough attention given to training of staff by financial institutions and corporations in order to be aware of trade-based money laundering? So I'll just refer back to just my earlier comments. I definitely think um, there needs to be more interaction between both sides, between AML compliance and between the trade finance uh, departments. Um, and kind of have a better appreciation by trade finance of some of these red flags um, so that, you know, in real time they can be detected um, and to, to better safeguard the, you know, the institution itself as well as, you know, prevent money laundering. Excellent. Thank you very much, Channing. And well, we are, we are a little bit, bit over the, the time, but it is an honor also to have Gabriela Rodriguez with us. Gabriela Rodriguez, quien es abogada y notario público de Nicaragua, ocupa el cargo de experta técnica de la Secretaría Ejecutiva del Gafilat desde abril del 2018 y en el marco de sus funciones ha participado de la evaluación mutua de la cuarta ronda del Perú y Chile. Actualmente se encuentra a cargo de brindar apoyo al grupo de trabajo de análisis de riesgo e inclusión financiera. 
Previamente o antes de formar parte del equipo de la Secretaría de Gafilat, fue jefe del Departamento de Supervisión de APNFDs de la UIF de Nicaragua, donde también se desarrolló como especialista de inteligencia financiera operativa y estratégica. Adicionalmente, participó junto a las autoridades de Nicaragua en la coordinación del proceso de evaluación mutua de Nicaragua en el marco de la cuarta ronda de evaluaciones mutuas del Gafilat. Uh, it is an honor to have you here with us, Gabriela, today for the final words para el cierre de la conferencia. Hola, ¿qué tal? Perdón, ¿me escuchan? Disculpa que tuve un, un inconveniente técnico y no podía iniciar ahí el video. Eh, bueno, Perfecto. muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por, por la invitación. Buen día a todos. Espero que todos se encuentren muy bien. Eh, en primer lugar, me permito agradecer en nombre también del doctor Esteban Julín, secretario ejecutivo del Gafilat, por esta invitación de este lanzamiento de un documento que tenemos la certeza va a ser de mucha utilidad para la comunidad internacional. Eh, desde ya me permito agradecer, eh, perdón, felicitar a la Global Financial Integrity por este esfuerzo de gran trascendencia que, como ya mencioné, es un aporte realmente importante para la región. Eh, como pudimos escuchar en las distintas ponencias de las panelistas, eh, si bien los países de América Latina y el Caribe han realizado importantes esfuerzos para la identificación de riesgos y amenazas, así como para el combate de muchos delitos asociados al lavado de activos, los cuales, como ya sabemos, generan un impacto importante en las economías de los países, no podemos dejar de tomar en cuenta las conclusiones y las recomendaciones que han sido planteadas en este informe. El documento que el día de hoy se está dando a conocer señala algunas amenazas que efectivamente están presentes en la región. Eh, bueno, ya las colegas lo mencionaron muy bien, tales como el lavado de activos, la corrupción, el narcotráfico, la trata de personas, entre otros. Pero también hicieron referencia a algunos sectores que han sido utilizados y vulnerados, tales como los abogados, los notarios, el sector de bienes raíces, y que en los últimos años eh, los informes de amenazas y de tipologías que el Capilata ha realizado también indican estos mismos resultados. Con lo cual, eh, no quiero dejar de señalar la importancia de este tipo de análisis, ya que son herramientas fundamentales para los países para el desarrollo de sus procesos de análisis de riesgo, para la priorización, para la priorización perdón, de actividades legislativas, para la aplicación de mayores recursos en escenarios de mayor riesgo, eh, y fundamentalmente para promover el fortalecimiento de las acciones de cooperación y de coordinación internacional en la lucha de todos estos delitos que ya hemos mencionado. Eh, no me queda más que agradecer nuevamente, felicitar a los ponentes que nos acompañaron y a todas las personas involucradas en el proceso y desearles eh, un gran día. Muchas gracias. Thank you so very much, Gabriela. Muchísimas gracias por, la, por las palabras. And, and without, without further, I, I, I let you, Channing, Lakshmi, Julia, Claudia, if you want uh, to close this, this up. I think I'll just say a quick thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, this was definitely a project we just absolutely enjoyed working on, um, both in terms of what we you know, were able to learn from this and, and the ability to take all of this information and put it into some really strong recommendations and provide uh, this information to our colleagues that are out, out there working on financial crime, working on transnational crime, and hopefully you know, it has a really great impact. Um, we encourage you to, to follow us, um, you know, follow GFI at, at Illicit Flows on Twitter um, and check our webpage uh, for kind of reports. We have them coming out all the time. Definitely going to highlight a report by my colleague Lakshmi and Kaiza DeBell on money laundering in real estate in the U.S. that came out recently. Um, but keep an eye out. We hope to continue this um, and we'll be looking more into uh, financial crimes in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, over the next year, in particular, looking at fraud, extortion, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, and um, oh, I'm forgetting one. Who's going to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it happens, but investment funds. Excellent. Okay. No, we will be looking. We will, will definitely be looking for those for for those new reports coming out from GFI. I'm telling you from myself and my personal experience. I've been involved in the financial crime field for 20 years, and I find everything GFI does fantastic. A great tool, great resources, great informations to be to be abreast in the in the fight against 
crimes in the fight against money laundering and, fi and financial crimes overall. Thank you so very much. And it was really a pleasure.